Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back to the 2022 National Land Care Conference. My name is Angela, and we're in the environment and climate change uh, stream. Uh, I'd like to introduce Andrea Spencer Cook as our first speaker today on the topic Shaping the Future of Land Care, UN Goals and Priorities of Nature and Climate. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I appreciate you have choices <laughs> and there's plenty of other streams you could choose to go to so I hope to make this one worthwhile. Um, I'd like to kick off just by paying my respects to um, indigenous owners all over the country but in particular the Gadigal of the Eora Nation where we are today um, and pay my respects to elders and indigenous people all over the world um, from whom we have so much to learn. Uh, so I am from the United Nations Association, I'm the Vice President, uh, and today I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the, the kind of high-level stuff that's going on um, in, in the world's corridors of power, um, and hopefully make the connection between what's going on at those sort of high, <laughs> remote, abstract levels and what land care can do um, today to, to already start implementing that vision. So, give no further ado. Um, the purpose of UNAA, we, have a, we, we, we exist to inform, inspire, and engage Australians to create a safer, fairer, more sustainable world. And we do that primarily through education and partnerships, uh, trying to help create partnerships between organizations to get people talking to each other, get people acting and implementing. And we do this across four pillars, so peace and security, human rights, sustainable development, and uh, global citizenship. Obviously, they're all interconnected, <laughs> um, but sometimes it's helpful to have, not, not to create silos, but to have at least some, some program logic that helps us organize ourselves, if, if nothing else. <laughs> um, so, Australia is a long-standing member of the United Nations. We were among uh, the countries that actually signed the original charter uh, and really influential in shaping a whole number of those early treaties that created the multilateral system as we know it today. Uh, so from creating the Charter, signing it, um, through to the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we had a really big influence in that too. Uh, so I think we can feel really proud and, and, and connected <laughs> to the UN, even though it may seem quite remote at times. Um, so. Effectively, what you have at the UN level, I like to think of it as environmental activists with ties and pens. Um, so <laughs> whereas land care, worker, land care volunteers will come with gloves and spades to do the stuff on the ground, we have a lot of very passionate people at that high level who are desperate to see change, desperate to see um, re real progress on the challenges and the issues that face us. Uh, in the environment, in, on social issues as well, and community and culture. Uh, but they do it in a very different way. So we need, we need both of them, right? We need, we need the whole lot. Um, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there, there can be quite a bit of criticism uh, about how slowly <laughs> the UN moves and how you, know, you can have these meetings and it takes a great deal of time before we see the final action. Um, so, so, yeah, if you take something like climate talks, they started in Berlin in 1995. Now, that's almost as old as most of us in the room, <laughs> or maybe, maybe a, a, a little younger than that, but still, it takes an incredible amount of time often before we start to see the actual results. But what the UN system is doing is creating that multilateral agreement, creating that consensus that enables us to move forward as global citizens on these issues and collecting a, 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 creating a shared vision. Um, so when it comes to the environment particularly, uh, that process has also been long. So we started in 1972, it was the very first time the UN held a conference that involved the word environment. It was the, uh, the UN Conference on the Human Environment, which is sh you know, known in short as the Stockholm Conference. Um, and then, 1992, we had the Rio Earth Summit, Agenda 21 was launched, 
2012, we had uh, Rio Plus 20, when a vision called the future we want was, was established. In 2015, that was a really significant year. We had the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 Agenda, and also the signing um, of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. So it's some really significant milestones in terms of multilateral agreements and vision. Um, but meanwhile, <laughs> as you can see, the environment has been getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So the trends are all in the wrong direction. The trends in terms of number of conferences, number of agreements are going up and up and up and up. So it's kind of cross, across a uh, cross, um, curve. <laughs> But uh, 2022 has been a really significant year, and that's really what I want to spend the rest of my time uh, talking to you about today. Um, we had, in particular, three really significant events this year, as far as well, we are having, because some of them are still happening. Um, but three really significant events have happened this year. The first of them being um, the, the Stockholm Plus 50. It's, it's, as I said, the timeline is slow. Well, it's 50 years since we had that first conference that involved the word environment. So uh, there was an opportunity this year for um, the, the, the member states of the UN, there's 193 of them, to come together and really look at what progress has been achieved, what do we need to do next, um, and rather than spending the time trying to get, you know, I's dotted and T's crossed, which a lot of these meetings are about, um, this was more of a visionary meeting to talk about what do we need to do, what comes next. Um, there was also uh, the UN Environment Assembly, and this is the highest governance um, forum for managing the environment in the world. Uh, and that came out with some really significant uh, conclusions and actions uh, this year. Um, and then finally, there's the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, or known in short as COP15, um, which has already kicked off. COVID has sort of slightly, uh, um, slightly staggered that, that particular um, process, but basically it, it's meant to take place in Kunming in China. It's now going to actually, it's been broken into two, and it's now going to finish off in Montreal uh, in Canada in November this year. But why that is significant is that it will set the global framework for um, how we manage uh, biological diversity for the next 10 years. So um, all of this will trickle down <laughs> with time. So Stockholm plus 50 key messages, as I mentioned, it was not, a, it was not a, uh, an event where big decisions were made. It was more an envisioning uh, session. But effectively, uh, the, 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 there was a big emphasis put on how important a healthy planet is for human well-being. It's not rocket science, we know this, but it's important that it's re-established and emphasized. Um, importantly, the um, right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment was stressed, and this is significant because it has now been uh, overwhelmingly voted for, unanimously voted for within the UN, that uh, the right to a healthy environment is a human right. Um, so this actually changes the grounds on which we can campaign for clean environment and puts a lot more strength around the idea that this is a right, not just a nice to have. Um, several of the issues that have come up uh, in the plenary sessions um, were echoed at Stockholm Plus 50, so I've been really delighted to, to see that alignment already. Um, Costa's passion for youth uh, came through also very strongly at Stockholm Plus 50. Uh, really strong emphasis on intergenerational responsibility. Um, finance, I've heard mentioned by <laughs> nearly every winner in the plenary. And uh, yeah, that, that, that need to align public and private financial flows, but in particular, uh, redirect so much of private capital that is currently going to unsustainable um, investment <laughs> and development to redirect that towards nature-based solutions and um, sustainable development. And then finally, uh, system-wide transformation. This is really about our unsustainable patterns of consumption and production. And there are fundamental, now there's much more coalescence around particular actions and particular transformations that have to occur in different industry sectors for us to get the economy aligned with 
the need to meet planetary boundaries um, and, and really ensure sustainable development and, and uh, just survival uh, for us and for all species. Um, so the UN Environment Assembly was the second one. This, as I mentioned, is the world's highest uh, environmental governance body uh, made up of the 193 UN member states. And they meet every two years to, to basically hold discussions that are based on science. So that's its strength, really, is that it brings the evidence to the table and tries to create uh, consensus and policy on the back of that evidence. Um, and it also does the tricky job of getting all these different nation states with different agreement, different interests and different motivations and different stages of development and different political persuasions and cultures to agree on what matters um, collectively. So uh, the big focus this year, um, was, uh, and also UNA, <laughs> UNEA or UNEA um, 5 was also split into two parts due to COVID um, in, in this instance. So a key focus was uh, the three interconnected crises of biodiversity loss, climate change, and pollution. These are really, if you, if you take one thing away from this talk, it's that. Those are our three problems. Um, and yes, there's population growth and all unsustainable consumption and production as well, and, you know, and any number of other things we can throw in uh, on top of that. But those are the three things we need to tackle most urgently. Um, if we don't tackle those, it puts our economic and social well-being even more at risk. Um, but at the moment, as I said at the beginning, we're failing to meet even the agreements we've already signed up to. So we're, we're, we're not delivering on our commitments, um, and we need uh, much more political will and much better implementation at the national and local level of these commitments. Um, there are sectors as well that, that are uh, particularly need to change. Um, what was good, because <laughs> I don't want to don't want to dwell on on on, on only the negative. Um, a snapshot of UNA outcomes: there were 14 resolutions, of which I've just picked out four here. Uh, but a really significant milestone was agreement to establish a legally binding treaty to phase out plastic pollution. This was a milestone. It's taken a lot of uh, time to get to this point. Um, and you can see there a delegate in tears <laughs> celebrating that milestone. So th these, are, these people with pens and ties are equally passionate about these outcomes. Um, the other thing that's significant, I think, for land care was there was a universally agreed definition of nature-based solutions. Um, I have it. I could read it out, but it's long and it's wordy, but it is multilaterally agreed. <laughs> so that's got to be good. Um, but it, it, it makes a foundation for really developing then nature-based solutions that have to tick off on a whole range of criteria, including uh, social um, well-being uh, and um, economic, um, you know, incomes for local communities, for example. So it, it's not just environmental definition. Uh, yes, uh, establishing a science-based, um, a science policy panel on the management of chemicals and waste um, and also reducing nitrogen waste were key outcomes from this. So we can expect to see a lot more on um, the management of chemicals and what good looks like and hopefully some quantitative targets coming out of that in years to come as to what we need to aim for. Um, the third uh, uh, big one that I wanted to mention to you was the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. Now, this um, is, is um, an, a new phase, if you like, in the CBD. The CBD was first uh, signed and launched in 2011. Um, there were 20 targets, uh, I think it's 20 targets, 20 targets known in short as the Aichi targets, none of which we have achieved at the global level. So a really big F. <laughs> On, on that one. Um, but now there's um, a big momentum around this new phase of the CBD or the new replacement, which will be the international framework for protection of biodiversity effectively at the global level. And the difference now is, yes, there's, there's two, two parts to it. One is this 2050 vision, 
which is living in harmony with nature, and that's the end goal. And then there have been these 21, uh, well, I'll come to the actual um, detail of it in the next slide, but there have been some targets set, quantitative targets, which are to 2030 to help us get towards, make sure we're on track for that 2050 vision. Um, so this is, the, the urgency behind this is, is really there because nature and biodiversity loss are accelerating, the trends are all in the wrong direction, as I said. And if we continue with business as usual, uh, we basically will lose um, the stability, any kind of stability in ecosystems uh, that we have taken for granted for so long. Um, so yes, an important strong framework is what we hope to get uh, out of Montreal in November. Um, there's the vision and 21 targets, as I said, for 2030. Um, these are, these dovetail with the sustainable development goals. Um, so some of them, there's quite a bit of overlap with those, but I've pulled out just a couple, uh, just a few here for you. Um, one overarching one is, is what's called the 30 by 30 objective, which is the idea that we protect 30% uh, of land and sea areas globally by 2030, so that these are literally set aside for nature. Um, and that's based on a science vision of, the long-term vision is 50 by 50, but that's, that's long-term. Um, a 50% reduction in the rate of alien uh, species and uh, a 50% increase in the control and eradication. So that's a really significant one for land care. Um, I don't know what the percentages are right now on how we're doing there, but suffice to say that the objective from, uh, or the goal that's going to come out of the CBD is to really significantly raise our level of ambition there and, and be much more um, effective in that area. Um, nitrogen was just mentioned in the plenary session, ways to, to uh, minimize nitrogen runoff um, and reducing loss of nutrients by half and reducing runoff of pesticides by two-thirds. That speaks to that issue of environmental pollution of chemicals in the environment. Um, and then nature-based contributions to deliver at least 10 um, gigatons of CO2e per year. So that's, uh, th that, that will be based on that nature-based solution uh, definition that I mentioned to you. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, very much looking at how we can um, start to turn or flip the switch on carbon as an externality and have carbon really um, baked into the price of goods, the price of services. Um, and last but not least, redirecting uh, harmful subsidies, which is, is always a challenge, but really is, is not done at the local level, it's much more at, at the global level. So what does all this mean for land care? Because <laughs> um, it can seem quite lofty, quite remote, quite, quite hard to pin down beyond just keep doing what you're doing, <laughs> which, is, which is great work. Um, there are a few things that I just pulled out here that I think will be relevant going forward. So these six key areas that come out of the um, Convention on Biological Diversity, eliminating plastic waste. So the idea being with this 2024 framework that will be legally binding is that we have no plastic pollution. We won't have no plastic pollution by 2025, but the idea is that we have a framework in place by 2025 that, that goes towards delivering no plastic pollution. So effectively, that's a circular economy um, uh, and, and reduce <laughs> reduce uh, policy. Um, managing chemicals, 66% less pesticide loss is what they're aiming for. So that's quite a significant um, step up from where we are today. Um, and 50% less nutrient loss in terms of nitrogen. 50% um, more reduction and control of invasive species. And I mentioned the 10 gigatons and the 30% areas of protected and connected land. So some some quite audacious and big and bold, hairy targets there, but I think they are also very helpful as a guide to action on the ground. That if we know that that's the kind of level that we're aiming for at the global level, well, we can start to implement some of those in Australia, in our work, um, in the day-to-day. -day. 
and we all have a role in it. Um, the executive secretary of the CBD says, you know, we need all hands on deck. And in particular, she, she highlights indigenous peoples and local communities as being um, really, really important um, in you know, partnering together to, to transform towards a nature positive future. So a uh, quick call to action, because you can't end a presentation without some kind of call to action. And that is uh, really, as far as the UNAA is concerned, um, there are UN global goals and commitments and if you learn about them, you can embed them in your work. Use them to communicate, use them to engage people. They are, they are, some of them are very great frameworks, um, and there's so many tools out there that you can adopt and use and just pull down to, to work with. Um, there's a lot of uh, really great leading practice that we can access through the UN network uh, again. And, uh, and so that's as well as feeding up into it, because we have some great practice here in Australia that I think needs to be known internationally. Um, and there are a number of uh, international awards, for example, like the UN Champion of the Earth, and I would love to see more Australians getting recognized uh, for their work at that level. Um, and finally, uh, yes, partnerships, because we certainly can't do any of this alone. Um, so, you know, re reach out to UNA if you have a great idea for partnerships in and around uh, embedding and implementing um, any of these high-level international goals. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, so that's me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Andrea. Um, we've got the online stream as well as people in the audience. So we've got some questions from the audience, but if anybody in the online stream has anything, we've got one. Um, will the UNAA state branches be promoting awareness of the UN decade of ecosystem rec restoration to halt more damage as in SOER? I love that question. <laughs> um, and the short answer is yes, we will. Um, we, we, we were somewhat uh, uh, sort of <laughs> held up or handicapped last year by COVID uh, because we had a whole lot of ideas and events planned which ended up being postponed and ca uh, sort of put forward. So we had just an online campaign last year, but we will be, we have an upcoming gala dinner um, at the end of October, on October the 21st, and the decade of ecosystem restoration will be a key focus at that gala dinner. So that's one way in which we're drawing attention, uh, but we'll continue to do so uh, through our socials and our work. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I'm a bit surprised. You, you've chosen not to make any comment on Australia's strategy for nature, which clearly aligns Australia's strategy for nature, which is a government document, with the ARCH and SDG um, objectives. Mm. Would you care to offer a comment on Australia's strategy for nature? Um, well, given that I only had, thank you for the question, and given that I had 20 minutes to talk about the sort of outside in view of the UN, I chose not to talk about what Australia is doing specifically, but more to talk about the, the, the higher level thing of what's bubbling under at the international level. Um, but certainly I think the more that we align at the national level with these frameworks, the better. And there are a number of areas in which we are well aligned. Yeah. But has your association actually offered any comment or assessment of how we're doing against those objectives? Against um, that strategy? Those not, objectives? not at this point, although we are in discussions um, with some other partner organizations to look at um, ways to measure Australia's progress in various areas against the Sustainable right. Development Goals, for example. Yes, because that's all documented on the uh, Australian mm -hmm. government's website at mm -hmm. the moment, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shall we just take one last question? Thank you so much for the amazing talk. It's, it must be so hard to condense all of that into 20 minutes. So now I appreciate it, especially not being, uh, yeah. I just find it always so hard to be informed by all of this. It's so mm -hmm. very confusing, so thank you. 
Um, I particularly was curious of the UNEA um, target of plastic pollution, and I was wondering a couple of things. One, if there's a definition that um, is given on what they mean by plastic, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I see in, at the state level, at least with these plastic bans, they always ban some things and not others, but they all call it the plastic ban. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there's any particular, you know, is it just single use of specific types? And also what they mean by, by legally binding, like what are the consequences if that's not achieved? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, look, the, the short answer is, is we don't know yet exactly what it looks like. We don't know yet exactly what the definitions will be because um, effectively what was voted into, what was, what was agreed on um, at UNEA 5 was that we would set up a group of experts to come up with a treaty framework. So that work has now started. It will be taking place throughout this year, throughout 2023, and they will be due to table their draft um, in 2024 of what that framework looks like, and that will contain the definitions. It will contain um, all those practical issues that you raise quite rightly. Um, and it is, it's a very fraught area. It's complex, um, but, but we will have great minds <laughs> and good expertise, I think, um, looking into it. And there is, what is, what is certainly uh, evident is I think reaching that agreement shows there is political will at the global level to address this massive challenge. Um, and that is a good thing. Now, political will at the level of addressing a challenge is one thing. We've also got to implement it, as you say. So legally binding, we, we've had legally binding frameworks that have been, you know, blatantly uh, uh, um, sort of <laughs> ignored, <laughs> let's say, or not implemented the way they should be. So um, the UN is not a policeman. It's not, it, it really comes down to national implementation. So for that, we have to look to Canberra. And I think uh, we can play a role as, as a community of UNAA, Landcare, others, um, in, in putting pressure on our leaders to uh, implement the, the laws and the frameworks that we adopt. Um, and, and making sure there's funding for that, because that is always the issue. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you.